Well, good morning. It's great to see you all again. I wasn't here last week. Uh, I missed you all very much. I know you all missed me very much. And, uh, but I was over at Summit Church, uh, way out in East Auckland. They meet in Howick Intermediate School, so it's like a kindred spirit. You know, you're meeting with another church that meets in a school with all the joys and the pains that that involves. So they're a great church, lovely bunch of people, and we've had a relationship with them for, for many years. They've been going about as long as we have, actually. Uh, I've known Brad for a long time there, the main preacher there. So it was lovely being over there. And this is, if you're new, this is all part of this mosaic series that we're doing over these nine weeks, uh, just rotating around between these three churches. So, so you had Jonathan Dove here last week, right? And I heard that was good. Uh, really good time with him. So from the, he's from Grace City, uh, and I'll be over there soon. And uh, you'll have Brad again at some point, and we're just going to keep rotating around as we work through this series. So it's, it's a funny thing. It's an unusual thing, but a really good thing. Well, it was a strange experience for me last week, driving down the motorway and passing Grace City and thinking, yeah, Brad's there, and I'm heading down here, and Jonathan's back at our place, and what is this going on? You know, but it's just great. This kind of thing doesn't happen as much as it should. Hey, church unity, so good. So um, I'm enjoying it, even if you're not. But uh, I think... <laughs> It's, it's, uh, I think all three churches really just are being blessed in different ways by the series. So uh, we're right in the thick of it now. Now, before we dive in today, we are going to do something uh, a little bit special. And I'm looking around to see. There you are. Are you over there, boys? Jonathan, Jesse. Hey, bring that map up here for a second. I just want to keep you connected to what our kids are doing, because as well as being across the three churches, this is also for us at Shore across the age groups. So all of our kids' ministries are also going through the Mosaic series. So I want you to see this. This is obviously a map. It's created by our very own Caroline Everett. It's amazingly done. And she's created this map and then all of these markers to show the different geographic locations where the Joseph story takes place. So each week, the kids are looking at the map and they're placing different locations in different places to show. Because, you know, you're learning like the Joseph story is full of journeys, isn't it? And so you're seeing uh, Canaan and Egypt and, and mapping these journeys that Joseph and his brothers eventually are taking to and from Egypt. So this is such a great visual tool, such a great piece of artwork, isn't it? And they'll keep using this. I mean, you could use this for most of the stories in the Bible. So much of the action takes place in this part of the world. So fantastic. Thank you, kids. I just wanted you to come up and show us that. Awesome. You can take that back out to um, where you're heading to boost, don't you? And have fun out there. Thanks, guys. So there you go. Yeah, and so uh, just you know, keep praying for what's happening out in our kids' areas as well. They're all working through it in different ways and taking things out of the stories. And those of you that have kids, be intentional about asking them what they've done in their, in their ministry areas and having those conversations. Use those table talk. Uh, questions in the devotional guide. You can get those from the website. Have those conversations because this is one of those times. It doesn't happen all the time, but we're all journeying through stuff together so we can use those moments to um, help each other learn. Okay, so for this morning, we are in Genesis 41. We're right in the thick of it now in this story. If you're just landing in this series today for the first time, that's fine. I would encourage you at some point to read from Genesis 37 through. That's where the story of Joseph starts. And catch up on the messages. If you, if you have a chance to do that, you can listen to them online on our website. You can also, of course, go and find them at the Summit website and at the Grace City website. And we'll also have some on the main Mosaic website as well. So you can listen to these messages in any of the three churches that you want to. Uh, but nothing like reading through Scripture for yourself as we go along. So if you've got the old paper Bible, pull it open. If you've got the Bible app, open it up. Genesis 41, and we'll have the Scripture reading on screen again by a selection of people from Shore, Summit, and Grace City. Here it is. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile, when out of the river there came up seven cows. Sleek and fat, they grazed among the reeds. Then after them seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile, and stood beside those on the river bank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. In the morning, his mind was troubled, so he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. 
Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh was once angry with his servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream that same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon, and when he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. God will give to Pharaoh the answers he desires. It is just as I said to Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of abundance are coming throughout the land, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and a famine will ravage the land. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all the officials. So Pharaoh asked them, Can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people shall submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne, will I be greater than you. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. All right. Let me uh, start with a question this morning. Have you ever had a day, a single day, that has dramatically changed your life for the better? Just have a think. Can you think of a day? You, you might have had days that have changed your life for the worse, but I'm talking about days that have dramatically changed your life for the better in a single day. Maybe it was a day that you saw coming, like your wedding day, maybe, uh, or the birth of a child. Maybe it was a day you didn't see coming. Maybe an unexpected financial windfall, maybe a new relationship suddenly popped into your life. Uh, maybe the day you became a Christian. Maybe you can look back on that. If you can look back on a single day when you became a Christian and you can, you can see that was a day that just dramatically transformed my life and changed it for the better. Have you got one of those days? Have you had a day like that? Some people have, where something's happened, whether you saw it coming or not, and suddenly circumstances have changed, your situation's changed, and your life is just suddenly taking a different turn. It's dramatically changed for the better. Now, you may have stories like that, but I would guarantee you that no matter how good your story is of a day that's changed your life, it would be hard to compete with this day in the life of Joseph. Because this one day that we're looking at this morning radically, dramatically changed Joseph's life forever. Most of this chapter, in chapter 41, is taken up with one single day. In Joseph's life. I don't know whether you picked that up reading the passage, but the whole story of Joseph unfolds over decades. So it covers a lot of ground, but the majority of chapter 41 is just one 24 hour period of time. And it is an extraordinary day. It is the most exceptional day in Joseph's life, and it changes the course of his whole life. This is like the pivot point on which Joseph's life turns, and it's really the, the pivot point on which the whole story of this family turns. All the ups and downs that we've looked at with this family, Jacob's family, this is a key day where the direction changes, and it's a key moment in the whole unfolding of the biblical story, a really important point in the story of Joseph. So what I want to do this morning is just walk you through this day. 
Just walk through this 24 hours in the life of Joseph and see what God has to teach us about our own lives from this. Sound all right? So, quick little recap here, just to, just to get our bearings in the story. When we start out here in, verse, in, in chapter 41, at the beginning of chapter 41, Joseph is now 30 years old. Okay, so he came to, to Egypt when he was 17 years old. So I know the series feels reasonably short so far, but we've already covered 13 years. All right? There's a lot of time that's already lapsed. Now, that entire time that Joseph has been in Egypt, he's either been a slave in Potiphar's house or he's been in prison. And we don't know exactly what the division of those two time periods is, how long exactly he was a slave, how long exactly he's been in prison. We know he's been in prison at least two years because this is the, the direction that we get at the beginning of the chapter, but it may well have been longer than that. The point is for 13 years now, Joseph has been in Egypt as a prisoner or as a slave. This has been a pretty dark part of his life. This has been a very, very bleak time. Remember, Joseph didn't have the Bible, right? He didn't have the rest of Genesis. He couldn't look ahead in the story and see what's coming up. We all look back now. We know how things work out. Maybe Joseph didn't know any of that. He's just there in prison, right? He's just languishing away in prison. He had that moment with, with the cupbearer where he thought maybe this was his escape route and maybe the guy would, would remember him to, to Pharaoh and that would get him out. And then that hope evaporated and he's just ending up back in prison. And as far as he knows at this point, there is no hope. There is no future. This is just... Prison is the rest of his life. It's a very, very bleak place that we find Joseph in at the beginning of this chapter. Now then, as chapter 41 starts, we have this change of scene. This interesting new scene in the story. And we're taken right in to the royal palace, the home of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And one night we're told Pharaoh has a dream. And we're taken right inside this dream, which has opened up to us. And in this dream, Pharaoh is standing on the banks of the River Nile. Now, that's a very significant picture, if you just think about that for a moment. Here's Pharaoh standing beside the Nile River. The Nile River, within the Egyptian worldview, was incredibly significant, not just as, as a major natural resource for Egypt, but also as a spiritual power. The, the Nile River was connected to the Egyptian gods, one particular god, the god Hapi, who was the god of the Nile and the god of the flooding of the Nile. And it was believed that, that each year Hapi would, was the one who would cause the Nile to overflow its banks and spill out and irrigate all the land surrounding. And this would produce the crops that Egypt relied on for their food source. So you can see the Nile River is inseparably connected to Egypt being able to be nourished and fed, and it's connected to the gods. This was all believed to be the work of the Egyptian gods who presided over people and looked after the land and needed to be kept happy in various ways. And so you have here this Nile River, a picture of spiritual power, a picture of natural power. You've got Pharaoh standing there who was the one representing the gods on earth as the, as the ordained ruler over Egypt. And then Pharaoh has this dream where up out of the Nile River, he sees these seven fat cows coming out and they're followed by seven skinny cows and the seven skinny cows eat up the seven fat cows. And then he has another picture that, that emerges, seven healthy heads of grain come out of the river and these are followed by seven withered up stalks, heads of grain, and they gobble up the healthy stalks of grain. And Pharaoh is deeply troubled by this dream. He doesn't know what it means. It's bizarre, but he's disturbed by it because he knows that it means something. Dreams meant stuff. You know, in the ancient world, people really believe that this is something has happened here that is disturbing the kingdom. It's not like today where you have a you have a strange dream and you wake up, you're like, that was a weird dream and you're going to have breakfast. For, for Pharaoh, it was like, this is a weird dream. Something's wrong. Something's wrong in the kingdom. Something's wrong in Egypt. I've got to figure out what this is. This was a threat to him. This was a threat to his power. This was some sort of sign. Maybe the gods themselves were upset. And so Pharaoh calls all of his officials together and he sees if they can interpret the dream. And none of them can. And then the cupbearer pipes up. Remember the old cupbearer? 
And he says, oh, yeah, there was something that I was probably supposed to say a little while ago. Uh, back when I was in prison, uh, there, was this, there was this Hebrew guy there, and he was really good at interpreting dreams. Uh, I, I sort of forgot about him. I'm kind of paraphrasing now, but I, I sort of forgot about him. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of mentioning him now, and hopefully that's okay, Pharaoh. And so Pharaoh's like, well, if this guy can interpret dreams, get him out here. Let's talk to him. And so Joseph is brought before Pharaoh and, and he gets changed first and he has a shave and he's made presentable and he comes before Pharaoh. And, and Pharaoh says to him, I've had these dreams. Do you think that you can interpret them? And I love the way Joseph responds to Pharaoh. And just have a quick look at this. I think verse 17, 16 rather. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer. He desires. Isn't that interesting? I think this is quite a different Joseph than the one we started with in chapter 37. You know, this is not the arrogant Joseph who's telling his dreams to his brothers. You're all going to be bowing down to me. Ha, ha, ha. This is Joseph, I think, has been humbled. I think, you know, 13 years as a slave and a prisoner has chastened him. And you have a man now who is far more aware of his dependence on God than he was before. And Joseph is basically saying... I, I can't interpret these dreams by myself, but I know the dream giver. I know the one who's given you these dreams, Pharaoh, and he will allow me graciously to give you the answer that you desire. And that doesn't mean, by the way, it's going to be the answer Pharaoh wants. It means it will be an answer, and hopefully that answer will at least put Pharaoh's mind at ease. And so Joseph explains the dream, the two dreams. And he says, Pharaoh, they are one and the same. And what this represents is this. There are going to be seven good years in Egypt. Seven years of abundance. Seven years, lots of food. Plenty for everybody. And then there is going to come seven years of famine. And it will be a famine like Egypt has never seen. And again, you think back to the Nile and the gods who were supposed to control the food source and the river. And, and this, is, this is subtly Joseph saying, it's not going to be the Nile that provides for everybody anymore, is it? It's not going to be these Egyptian gods that look after people anymore. There is going to be a famine that's coming like you would not imagine. It's going to be a famine like the whole world has never seen. And you better get ready. And Joseph, he gets a little bit cheeky at this point, And he says, now, Pharaoh, here's what you need to do. He kind of starts to give some economic advice here. And he says, now, during the good years... What you should do is, is store up as much grain as you can. Take a fifth of the produce, take a fifth of the harvest, store it up, get ready. And then if you're, if you're careful in the good years, if you're prudent in the good years and you put a lot away, then you'll have enough for the years of famine to be able to feed the people. And Joseph, if you read it closely, he even gets cheekier than that, doesn't he? Because then he says, now, Pharaoh, what you need is a wise and discerning man, Pharaoh. You know, you need someone, Pharaoh, who is going to have the skills to be able to oversee this whole project. There's a lot going on here. You're going to need someone who knows how to, how to oversee this whole project for the good of your kingdom. And, you know, this is, it's, it's like reverse psychology, isn't it? You make the person think they came up with the idea. So Pharaoh's then thinking, yeah, man, that's right. Who, you know, who, could I, who, is, the, who is this person? And Joseph's standing right there in front of them. And Pharaoh goes, I've got it. It's you. I'm paraphrasing again. But it's you, Joseph. You are the one who is going to be in charge of this whole project. I'm going to get you to implement. You came up with the plan. You've interpreted the dreams. There's nothing you can't do. This is incredible. I'm going to put you over not only my palace, but over the entire land. Now, just look at this. I, I want you to see what Pharaoh actually does here and, and the kind of power that he gives Joseph, because it's extraordinary. Have a look in verse 41. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Now, that, the role that Pharaoh is giving to Joseph here, there's a term for it, and it's called the vizier. The vizier. And it was a term. Within ancient Egypt, somebody held that office, and they were second in command to Pharaoh. So Pharaoh still maintains his power. He's still the king, right? He's the emperor. He has ultimate authority. But just under him is the vizier. And that person is essentially like the prime minister. 
of the land. If you think of like a strong monarchy where you have a king who governs or a queen who governs, and then you have a prime minister who rules and oversees and creates the laws of the land. That is what Joseph is becoming. He's being elevated to the status and the role of prime minister, second in charge only to Pharaoh. Verse 42, then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. That signet ring is Pharaoh's authority. So that basically means now whatever Joseph says, it carries the weight of Pharaoh. It is as if Pharaoh himself has spoken. When you've when you got Pharaoh's signet ring on, you, you are invested with Pharaoh's own authority when you go out into the land and talk to people and give orders. Incredible authority. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Again, these are symbols of power and status and authority. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And people shouted before him, make way. So Joseph basically gets a motorcade here. He gets like a presidential limousine. Now he's driving around. He gets the fancy chariot. People are bowing down before him wherever he goes. This is an astronomical rise to fame, isn't it? This is phenomenal what's happened. And even more phenomenal when you think it's all happened in a day. In one day. So just picture it. Joseph woke up that morning in prison as a prisoner with guards outside the door. And that night, he goes to bed as the prime minister, still with guards outside the door, but now those guards are there to protect him and do whatever he says. I mean, what a phenomenal promotion. What an incredible day. Anyone had a day like that? I mean, not even Nelson Mandela had a day like that. Not even he managed to go from prison to president that quickly. This is one day. It's, an, it's a dizzying rise to fame that Joseph has experienced here. And it must have been overwhelming for Joseph himself to suddenly be given this kind of power, this kind of authority. I mean, imagine the other officials looking on. They've spent their life working up the ladder to try and get to this vizier position. Suddenly this prisoner swoops in and takes the job. You know, Joseph probably made some enemies that day, I would say, as well as friends. But what an incredible rise to fame Joseph has experienced. Now, just press pause on the story there for a minute. Let's just start to connect a few dots into our lives. I know this is, this is extreme and dramatic stuff, and you've never had a day quite like that, have you? But I think one of the things we can take from the story is that just like Joseph, our lives do have different seasons to them. And the turning points for you may look very different. And it may not all happen on a day. Sometimes it can happen over a much longer period of time. But Joseph has come from a very, very dark, wintry season of life into a really summery season now that then defines the rest of his days. And in the same way, we go through seasons of our life that are really tough. We go through really hard times, times of real struggle. And then sometimes the corner gets turned. And we come into a season that's just full of blessing. And, and we just feel good about life. And things are humming. And sometimes it is just particular events and circumstances that switch and shift and change and then suddenly we're just in a new kind of pattern. Sometimes something happens at work, you get a promotion, business opportunities just expand massively and sometimes you're just in a new season. It's a season of growth, a season of good things. You just, things are humming. Sometimes maybe it's financial, an inheritance lands on your lap, something like that, and suddenly you've got opportunities before you didn't have before, you've got new possibilities, things are opened up for you. Maybe it's a new relationship <laughs> that comes along your path, and suddenly you're in a new season. You're happy. All you want to be is with this person, and, and you know, your spirit is just lifted, and you just feel good about life. You know these seasons, Right? The turning points look different. The experiences look different. But we all have these times in our life where you are in a, in a place of blessing. And you're in a place where life feels good and it just feels like the pieces are fitting together. Now, those are good times. Some of you might be in that season this morning. I don't know. You might be just cruising. You feel like, you know, life is good right now. I'm just, I've, I've come to church. My heart is full. My tank is full and I'm feeling happy. That's something to give thanks to God for, isn't it? I mean, that's something to be grateful for. These are gifts from God. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down to us from the Father of lights. We can thank the Lord when these good things come along. But here's what I want to say. We also need to be aware that in those summer seasons of life, there is a danger. There is a unique danger that lurks in the shadows of these summer seasons 
that can be incredibly deadly for our faith. And we don't always see it coming because we assume, well, God's brought these blessings into my life, so my, my faith will be fine. Obviously, you know, he'll sustain me. I don't need to worry too much about my spiritual life in these times. I'm, I'm going to be good. But we need to be aware of something that started to happen in Joseph's life, a temptation that started to come along, that if we're not careful, will catch us off guard, and it can be fatal. So look at what happens here. In the very next couple of verses, we see something interesting happening to Joseph. Verse 45, Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zephanath Pania, and he gave him Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, to be his wife. Now, do you know what that means? So Pharaoh has renamed Joseph, and it's not a Hebrew name. This is an Egyptian name. Nobody knows exactly what it means, but it's probably named after one of the Egyptian gods. So Pharaoh is giving Joseph this name that is fully immersed with all of the pagan mythology of, that the Egyptians worshipped. And then he gives him a wife who is the daughter of a priest of Egypt. So now Joseph's family that he's marrying into, his father-in-law is a priest who facilitates the worship of pagan gods. Like this is a family deeply embedded in the worship of false idols. Now that's Joseph's family. That's Joseph's wife. That's Joseph's father-in-law. So can you see what Pharaoh's trying to do here? He is trying to Egyptianize Joseph. He's basically saying, you, you can leave that old identity behind. You don't need the God of your fathers. You don't need that old story. What you need now is to be Egyptian. This is your world now. This is your home. He wants him to, to talk like an Egyptian, walk like an Egyptian. <laughs> you know, he wants him to think like an Egyptian. Worship the gods of the Egyptians. He is trying to go full immersion on Joseph and say, this is the whole worldview now that you need to be immersed in if you're going to be my number two. You're going to have to worship the same gods I worship. This culture, this language, these people, these are your. Leave Canaan behind. Leave the family behind. Leave all of that behind. No longer the Hebrew identity. Now, fully the Egyptian identity. Can you connect the dots in your own life? Can you see where this is going? It's not hard, is it? This is the very same temptation that the children of Israel experienced when they entered into the promised land. Let me just read a little passage that really brings this home in Deuteronomy 8. You don't have to turn there. Just listen to this. Here is a warning given to Israel before they're about to enter the promised land. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Can you see the danger? Can you see the temptation? That in these summer times of success, affluence, prosperity, and abundance, and blessing, they're good things, but they're a double-edged sword. Because the danger in those times is that we start to forget the Lord. We don't mean to. We don't set out to do that. But just gradually, through spiritual inertia and the pull of the cultural forces around us, we just start to get this slippage in our lives and in our faith, and God starts to take more and more of a back seat. Listen to the sobering words of Os Guinness. He said, Rebellion against God does not begin with the clenched fist of atheism, but with the self satisfied heart. Well, that's challenging. You know, the greatest danger for us walking out of here is not that we become clenched fist atheists, it's that we become self satisfied people is that we've just got so much going for us, we can rest in our own affluence and we can provide for ourselves. What need is there for God? What need is there for faith? Of course, we don't think that way. We still come to church and pay lip service to God. But in our lives, we can become self-sufficient and God just gets further and further into the background. When things are going well in your career, it is easier and easier and easier to have your heart drawn towards money, drawn towards profit, drawn towards greed, drawn towards wealth, drawn towards financial security. It's why the Bible warns us, though your riches increase, do not set your heart upon them. It says that because that's the danger. That's the temptation for us. When things are, are, are great in your life relationally, there's a new person there that's fantastic, but the danger is that person becomes the obsession. 
More and more of your heart is attached to that person. All you want is to be with that person. All you love is that person. Your heart is just so connected, so attached to that person. God is somewhere in the background. And that person may be a Christian. They may be a wonderful person. But even so, they can become the object of your desire rather than God. This so easily happens in times of success. You get a bit of power. You get a bit more responsibility. Pretty soon the ego kicks in. Pretty soon you start thinking you're a big deal. Pretty soon you become self-sufficient and your heart becomes cold and hardened towards God. You know the most deadly thing? You hardly ever see this coming. You hardly ever notice when it's happening. But very subtly and very gradually, our heart is pulled away from God, from God's sufficiency to self-sufficiency. And that is a very real and present danger that Joseph faced. In fact, Pharaoh was trying to make it happen. And it's just as much of a danger for us today, especially in the good times, especially in the summer seasons, because we're off guard then, aren't we? We're just cruising, we're coasting, and we're happy. It's precisely at those times the evil one will rush in and create a sense of spiritual complacency in your life. So what do we do? How do we avoid this? I think most of us would say that's, that's not where I want to go, that's not where I want to be, but how do I avoid it? If it's that subtle, how can I head this off in my life? Well, again, we can learn from Joseph. Joseph does some very strategic things here. I think he sees this. I think he knows this. And I think he takes some very purposeful steps to stay connected to God during these times. Have a look at one particular thing he does. It was so fascinating. Uh, verse 50. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh. Now, Egyptian name or Hebrew name? It's a Hebrew name. Interesting, hey? So Pharaoh gave Joseph the Egyptian name. Joseph had no choice about that. But when it comes to naming his own sons, what does he do? Draws a line in the sand. He says, I'm not bringing that into my family. And he names his own son Manasseh, a Hebrew name. And it means, here's the meaning right here. And said, it is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. It's because the word Manasseh, it sounds like the Hebrew for to forget now, Joseph's not literally saying he's forgotten his family or he's forgotten his father. He's holding them in his heart. We know that. But what he's saying is he can look back and see that God's been faithful. The God of his fathers has been faithful all the way through and has now brought him out of that season and into a new season. And then keep reading. Verse 52, the second son, he named Ephraim. Egyptian name or Hebrew name? Hebrew name again. And he said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. So here is Joseph twice now taking Hebrew names for his children, names that remind him of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I think Joseph was well aware that the culture around him and his own boss was doing everything they could to Egyptianize him and I think this is Joseph taking some very intentional steps to stand against that. He knew the pull. Joseph's the only person worshipping God in all of Egypt, as far as we know. Right? You've got a whole culture here that's worshipping pagan gods. How hard is that? But in the midst of it, even though Joseph's experiencing great success, he sees the danger and he takes the steps necessary to keep God front and center in his life. I mean, that's, you couldn't think of a better way to do it, could you, than with the names of your own children? We've got Manasseh and we've got Ephraim. Every time Joseph takes those names on his lips, he's reminded of God, the God of his fathers. You know, Manasseh, time for dinner. That's right. God has been faithful. Ephraim, time to get in the chariot. That's right. God has made me fruitful. Every time he says the names of his own boys, God is front and center. And not the gods of the Egyptians, but the one true living God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, you know the question, don't you? What is your Ephraim? And what is your Manasseh? Because we need them. If Joseph needed them, we're going to need them. Now, I'm not saying you can go out there and rename your children. right? Don't, don't take this too literally. That would get confusing anyway, because then all of our kids would have the same names. 
But what you've got to do is translate this into 21st century Auckland and say, well, what's it going to look like for me? The principle is you're going to need some things front and center in your life in the good times to sustain you and keep God front and center in your life, taking those intentional steps to remember, remember, remember the God of your fathers. So what's it going to be? I saw, I was watching a few weeks ago an interview with a guy called Gary Grant. I don't know whether you've heard of him. He uh, has started and he's the chairman of a toy retailer in the UK called The Entertainer. Some of you may have been there. Uh, They've got about 180 stores now. And Gary's grown it in the the 1980s. He got just one, started with one toy store. And he's grown it now to about 180 toy stores. Biggest independent toy retailer in the UK. So he's seen a lot of success. And he's made a lot of money. And he's got a lot of recognition and accolades for that success over the decades. He's done incredibly well. And Gary's also a Christian. And he talks in this interview about how in the midst of all that success that he's experienced in life, the things that he has learned to do to keep his faith front and center in his life and in his business practices. Now, one of those practices that he has is he gives money away from his business. He tithes off his business. So he talks about how God confronted him with the importance of tithing in his own life And then from there, God challenged him and said, no, I want you to tithe off the profits of your business. And so in the operating budget of the entertainer every year, there's a line item of giving away to charity and they will give 10% of their profits away to children's charities, to children's hospitals in the local areas, to children's orphanages in in Africa. And he will send that money. And he doesn't do that for accolades. It often happens behind the scenes and it's very understated work. But for Gary, this is a part of him keeping his Christian faith front and center because he recognizes he's in the retail industry in the heart of a competitive, commercialized, ruthless, profit-driven industry. And he knows he's in the heart of a culture that is driven by money and greed and the possession of wealth. And so he knows he's had to take intentional steps. He's got to put in place measures, not just for the sake of his business, but for the sake of his own heart to keep God front and center. And those practices are like his Ephraims and his Manassas. Now, I know that's, that's his story. That's not your story. You could say, well, that's easy for him. He's the chairman. He owns the company. He can do what he likes. I know. But you ask yourself, what's your world? And what's your Ephraim going to be? And what's your Manasseh going to be? You translate this into your environment and your context. Maybe your Ephraim is a person. Think about it that way. Maybe you are climbing the ladder and and you're experiencing success and the career is going well. What is going to help you stay grounded is another person. How about having another person who you meet with regularly and you open your heart up to them and you say, I I want you to ask me how it's going with my faith. Don't just ask me how it's going with the business. Don't just ask me about money. Ask me how I'm going in my walk with the Lord because I see the danger. I see the temptation of my heart being drawn away. And by you and I having this accountability relationship, I can stay grounded and this can keep me on the right path. Do you have that person? Could you find that person? Could you ask God to bring that person along to you? And could you be vulnerable enough to ask them to ask you some difficult questions along the way? Maybe you could ask them the same questions. It's nothing that'll keep you grounded like another person who shares your faith who can ask you questions. How is it really going in your walk with the Lord? In the midst of all you're experiencing in your life, you may be getting accolades all over the place. And yet, can you have another person who's asking, how is it with your soul? How connected are you to the living God? Maybe your Manasseh is just a quiet commitment today in your own heart to stay anchored in the Word of God. And you know how often this happens. When life gets good and things just coast along and cruise along, this book can just go out the window and it just becomes a distant memory. You've got too much else to do, other things to focus on. Maybe today, in the quietness of your own heart, it's coming back and saying, I want to ground myself again in this story. This is my story. The very story we're reading this morning of Joseph, this is one of the ways God is bringing us back to who he is and the reality of what he's doing in our lives and in our world. Maybe if you've had slippage in that area in your life, 
and that practice has become really patchy for you, today is a day to say, I'm coming back to the Word of God. This is where I'm going to meet the living God. This is where I'm going to hear from God. This is where I'm going to be nourished and strengthened in my faith. This is what I need to keep me grounded. This is going to be my Manasseh. Maybe for you, it is the simple commitment of committing to these gatherings, Sunday by Sunday. You know, in a few minutes, we're going to come up, we're going to take communion together. You're going to hold in your hand a little wafer. You're going to hold in your hand a little cup of juice. You know what they are? That's Ephraim and Manasseh. Right there, isn't it? There's your reminder. Why do we do these things every week? Why do we gather every week? Because you're going to go out these doors into a world that is going to do its best to squeeze you into its mold. You're naive if you don't think that's going to happen. The world is going to do everything it can do this week to colonize your heart and your mind. That's what the world does. And it will squeeze you and it will shape your life, your values, your priorities, and your direction. And if you're going to swim upstream for that, it's not enough just to say, well, I'm going to hope for the best. You need to be intentional and say, I'm going to gather with the family of God I'm going to commit myself to the practice of the Lord's Supper. And that is why we come back each week to the cross. We come back to Jesus. These things ground us. They keep us anchored in what is most important, the death and resurrection of Jesus. By taking this meal together, we are saying no to all of the attempts of the world to just squeeze us into its mold. The world, if you let it, will disciple you. It will teach you its ways. And if we're going to be different people, then we need to make some different choices and put some different commitments in place in our lives that will keep us grounded. Maybe for you today, it's that quiet commitment in your heart of saying, this is where I need to be. This is my refuge every Sunday. You're going to be out there being battered by the world. And it's not just a job and it's not just a social life. It is the pressure of a culture that is seeking to colonize you. And this is an island of refuge where you come back to the center Jesus on the throne, the crucified and risen Messiah. Maybe that's the commitment you need to make today. Maybe it's something else. I don't know what it is for you. What is your Ephraim? What is your Manasseh? Who is your Ephraim? Who is your Manasseh? If you do a quick Google search online, you're going to find so many books about having a faith that will get you through the hard times. A faith to survive the difficult times, clinging to God when life is hard. I think what we need are more books about a faith to survive the good times. Because I just wonder if there is a greater danger sometimes in the summer times of life than the winter times. That there's a greater spiritual complacency that sets in precisely because we don't worry about it and we don't think about it. So that's my question for you. Do you have a faith that can survive good times without forgetting the God of your fathers? The simple choice is, are you going to become like the Israelites in the wilderness who just forgot God and left him behind? And maybe that's where you've been this morning. And maybe this has been a moment of realization to say, yeah, you know, I have just let this slip. I have, to be honest, forgotten God. And I can come and sing the songs and listen to a sermon, but in my heart of hearts, I've, I've just let this happen. And there's a huge chasm that's opened up and the good news is God is so endlessly gracious to you. All he wants to do today is welcome you home. He doesn't stand there to judge you. He just stands there to say, come to me, daughter. Come to me, son. Welcome home. Let's walk together again and let me strengthen you and ground you in my grace. So if that's you today and you have wandered a long way and you already see this happening in your life, just accept the open arms of the Father today and run back into his embrace. That's what he's longing to give you. But will you then commit to being like Joseph? to having your Ephraim, to having your Manasseh, and not forgetting the God of your fathers. Let's take the steps we need to take. Let's be purposeful. Let's be proactive. Let's be intentional so that we stay grounded and anchored in our faith, not only in the hard times, although yes, of course, in those times, but also in the summer seasons, the good times, the seasons of blessing in our life, so that in those times, we would keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, our vision, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let's pray. God, you know exactly where everyone in this room is at this morning. You know the seasons of life. 
And some are going through the hard times, the winter seasons today, and others are going through those real summer times. And we want to pray, Lord, for those times when life is good, that we would never forget you. And even saying those words, Lord, I just think of the way the Israelites said those words so willingly, and yet they went and forgot you anyway. It's so easy to say it. It's so easy to say it when when we're here and we're hearing your word. But God, in those times when we are tempted to just put you aside, in those times when we are tempted to be distracted by a million other things, Lord, would you bring back to our hearts and minds Ephraim and Manasseh. And Lord, for each person here, each person watching online, I pray, Lord, you'd settle on their heart this morning who their Ephraim is going to be who their Manasseh is going to be, what practice that Ephraim might represent for them, that we would have those things just like Joseph's sons in our lives, that every time we see them, every time we do them, every time we meet with them, that we would be reminded of you in a world that's doing its best to try to make us forget you. Lord, we want to do those things, be those people that remember, remember Remember who you are. Lord, help us in this. We're so dependent on your grace. We're so weak. We need your strength. We need your spirit. We rely on your grace at every moment. Help us to remember you, O God, and never forget. In Jesus' name, amen.